All right, so now I'm going to continue on with uh, the rest of the, the alignment talk. We'll probably get into the atlases soon, too. Okay, so now let's, we've talked about affine transformations that have those 12 parameters. Now we're gonna, going to take it to nonlinear warping. It's taking it up to another level, and we're going to end up with thousands and thousands of parameters, 50,000 parameters maybe over a whole data set. And so what we're going to do is... Uh, uh, rather than calculate over, all, uh, find one transformation for the for for uh, one day for one part for a whole data set, we will find transformations for parts of the data set. We'll look at looking at, at twisting our source image onto our our base image using cubic polynomials, and we'll start off with very large polynomials that stretch over the whole data set, cu large cubic polynomials, kind of splines, and then th and gradually uh, go through a procedure where we'll get to smaller and smaller transformations and, and then uh, to a small neighborhood of maybe 11 voxels wide around uh, every voxel. So, and the result of a nonlinear transformation of all this twisting is a series of deformations. So uh, that's in the end, that's what we get. We get a delta X, a delta Y, and a delta Z for every voxel uh, in our data set. So how do we move our source image to our destination? We'll move it by delta X, delta Y, and delta Z. A very complicated procedure to give us a fairly simple result. And we use this program called 3D Q Warp to do that. This will calculate the alignment. We will apply the alignment transformation. So 3D Q Warp will, will do this for a particular data set. If we want to apply the same transformation to other data sets, we'll use 3D N Warp Apply. And then we have other tools for dealing with concatenating and calculations of those transformations. Uh, other and and then alignment tools that will use 3D Q warp. So uh, auto warp will call 3D Q warp, and afniproc.py can also call 3D Q warp. We'll also talk here in a moment about uh, blip up, blip down correction. This also uses 3D Q warp. We'll see that here. Okay, so blip up, blip down correction. This is a special acquisition procedure where you acquire your slices in one direction, maybe anterior to posterior within a slice, and then do another set of acquisitions where you do posterior to anterior in the opposite direction. And so what you'll see, depending on your scanner and, and the subject, you'll ha have some distortions. So here we're, we're losing parts in the anterior and uh, uh, and then if we flip the direction, we get some of those parts back. We get, it goes a, bit, a little bit more that way and a little bit less on the, on the posterior side. And so we have a blip up and we have a blip down. And we say that the correct uh, distortion is somewhere in between. We'll pick the halfway in between distortion nonlinearly. So we'll, we'll align the blip up to the blip down and take the halfway transformation. This is different from the field map correction, right? This is different from a field map correction. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, do the field map correction. Field map correction is, is done differently. Generally, field map corrections are done over a much smoother field, uh, um, and, and it's uh, what it does it has the same goal as this. It, it's it's done completely differently. So we did a comparison of field map correction versus this versus top up, which is FSL's version of this. And for our data at NIH, this worked better. So here's the result, the corrected data set, this one that goes to this in between of the blip up and blip down. This was on our 7T scanner. So it depends on your data, whether, whether you need it and how well it works. So. That, that blip up, blip down correction is now included in AFNIPROC2, so you don't actually have to, to call our script, uh, which makes it a little bit harder to integrate it into your, your linear models. Uh, AFNIPROC will do this for you. 
And yesterday I went on a little rant about the left right. This is actually this is what I was talking about. This is how you can check it. This is uh, edge displays. So one of our users, uh, Brad Buxbaum, he found he found this problem in the FCON 1000 data set, and we've we've uh, uh, automated this now into a Line API and add. So you can check for flipping uh, with just the check flip option. If the data is flipped, it will give you a warning. The flip data aligns better than the original data. That's, a, that's not good if that's the case. As I said yesterday, we don't know what's left and we don't know what's right. We just know that the two don't match each other. So you would have to figure that out either with a vitamin E capsule or, or there's a lesion on a certain side or the subject has tilted their head a certain way. You know that you've given them instructions for that, that kind of thing. It might be worth noting that uh, it's been common in the open uh, the data sets that the anatomical data set is correct, but the EPI data set is, is more often incorrect than missing information. Okay. So, yeah, so, you know, most often you can find the anatomical will be correct, um, but you have to know something about the processing of it. Uh, generally, people will bring it through different uh, pipelines. So there was a format called Analyze that was popular for many, many years. Uh, it's the precursor for nif the nifty data sets. It has no orientation information in the header. So if they use the Analyze format, you kind of trust that they've done a whole series of things that could be right, uh, but they will lose that, that header information. Uh, and so even if they produce a nifty data set at the end, it may not be right. And nifty data sets could be missing header information. They could have incorrect header information. DICOM can be wrong. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong that can cause left-right flipping. Uh, and there are tools like this to check for it. We also have a script for doing DWI motion correction. I won't talk too much about it, but it, it uh, using a line API in that or 3D Alineate and these kinds of tools that we've talked about, you can create different kinds of scripts that will do correction for you. This is an iterative procedure that will find, it will synthesize a new DWI data set based on the motion corrected data set and, uh, uh, the, from the tensor and uh, re it does this multiple times to, and uh, then aligns itself to itself, basically. Anyway, I'm going to switch to a somewhat different topic, but related, uh, the idea of atlases. So inside atlases, I like to start out with some definitions because everybody uses the word atlas in a different way, and so I'm going to use it in a specific way because it causes less confusion for me and hopefully for you. Okay, so um, uh, first let's start off with the idea of a template. This will be some sort of reference data set that we're going to line everything to. Uh, it's going to define our space, which is the next definition. So an example of a template is the TTN27 data set. Um, we have uh, other kinds I'll show you in a moment. So the N27 data set, this was the, uh, the Colin, also known as the Colin brain, someone who had his brain scanned 27 times in a row. They were all aligned to each other and averaged, and so it's a very good, high quality brain, and it's probably the, been the most studied brain ever. Um, and this is what it looks like in Talarac space. We also provide the one in MNI space and in MNI and at space. We'll talk about what that means too. Okay, so the template space. Now the space of a data set is important. It, it means that every XYZ location in that, that data set corresponds to th the same thing in the template and to every, every other subject that is in that same space. So MNI space is, a, is an example. Talarac space is another. The space that it's acquired in is, is, is its a ridge space. We'll call it that a ridge space, the native space of the acquisition. So every data set has a template space. If you do 3D info dash space, you'll see it. 
And then finally, we have the word atlas. So atlas is uh, is the where the segmentation or the parcellations are stored. So they will generally look something like this, these multi multicolored things, uh, where every voxel is assigned a region um, and a name. Uh, the, the region has a number and a name. It has a particular intensity and index in it. Uh, this is the Icofzillus macro label atlas. It's in the TTN 27 space. Okay, so we include a lot of different templates with, with AFNI. Uh, uh, we include the N27 data sets. We include uh, these averages of 152 data sets. This actually came from the MNI, well, this MNI data set. So the original MNI template was an average, well, there have been several versions of it, 300 data sets, 300 subjects or 152 subjects. Uh, and there's the ICBM one that's uh, 452 subjects. Uh, and they were just, um, they were affinely aligned and averaged and y you end up with this kind of a, a blurry brain. More recently, the 2009 uh, uh, MNI version is, is much, much better and it's one that we recommend now. Um, uh, so this is the MNI 152T1 2009. There's a, a few variations on this, A, B, and C. Uh, we provide uh, these things with, with AFNI, uh, and you can get them elsewhere too. So you can get an, a, a data set from anyone, any, temp, any, any data set could be a template. If you want to see this in AFNI, you can set your AFNI global session environment variable to be where your, where your templates are stored. And every time you, choo you set choose data set, it will be there. This brings up the topic, why should we use a standard space? There are lots of reasons to use them and a lot of reasons not to use them. That said, I will say that almost everyone uses a standard space when they do fMRI on humans. In the animal world, not so much. Uh, and there are cases where you do need to use it, in some cases you don't want to use it. So it makes comparing subjects a lot easier because it's done voxel-wise, it's all kind of automated. Uh, you've got coordinates that you can standardize with other people. So a, a paper says it's at this coordinate, you can look at the coordinate on your data and see if you see the same kind of thing. Why you wouldn't want to use it if you have inconsistencies, lesions, uh, uh, a, a lot of variability on your subjects. Uh, you don't actually need to look, you don't have many subjects and you don't, you're not doing a group analysis. You're looking at a particular region and you know how to, where to find that region. You can draw your own anatomical regions and say, this is the, the area that I'm interested in. <coughs> Rats, macaques, humans, this is what I want. And that makes statistical analysis a lot easier too because you don't have to account for multiple comparisons of 100,000 voxels. You only have a handful of animals and tests that you need to account for. So you have to choose a template if you're going to use a standard space. And you should choose one that's like the subjects you're looking at. If you're looking at humans, a you know, human template would probably be a better idea. So macaques, we've got macaque templates. Pediatrics, you know, we've not the kids are a different group than humans, but you can, we have a pediatric template available. And we're also working on an elderly template. Um, so try to choose one that's similar to the group, to, to the group that you're studying. Uh, and you can make your own, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We have these, these scripts here. Uh, and it does this uh, procedure where we do an affine warp first to, to a, some initial base template, and then we'll continue on to, uh, to do a nonlinear warp to, to uh, uh, make a template iteratively. So we'll take uh, uh, a, rough, a rough calculation using the, the large neighborhoods in the nonlinear warping, and then we'll go to smaller and smaller, and every time we we do these, these calculations, we'll average over to see what are the average across all data sets and use that as our new starting base. And so we'll get a new final template. And that's how we did a, a, a pediatric template with uh, the Haskins Institute. 
and we're, we're working on, on a lot of other things like that. We, uh, I'm in the process of making a new one that will do this using um, a, a, a parallelization scheme uh, called DASK. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's parallelization using a cluster. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing 10 subjects or 1,000 subjects. It will do this all in parallel and, and make a template for you. So hopefully that will be done within a couple weeks. OK, so the initial idea of atlases uh, uh, in MRI, well, this came out b before MRI. Talarak and Tourneau, they came out with this book in 1988 where they, they did half of a, of a, a woman's brain, uh, uh, and they, they put the, the, that, that brain into as post-mortem analysis. They put slices five millimeters apart uh, and drew, well, they put it into a kind of coordinate system, um, the stereotaxic procedure that they're famous for, and um, drew, drew various regions. And they said when they did it, whatever you do, this is made to describe this one woman's brain. Don't apply it to anyone else. And of course, that's what happened. Everyone has been using it for many, many years, the Talarac Tourneau procedure. And, uh, uh, and we, we have it built into AFNI, this procedure of, of dividing up the brain into different coordinates and you define your AC coordinates in the superior edge and the posterior edge and the PC coordinate and then the mid sagittal points and and uh, and the most inferior and the most uh, superior points and uh, and the whole box that the whole the uh, the brain is in and we used to spend time in a class like this a lot of time for everyone to do it and it's 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 a kind of laborious procedure uh, that it, it's about 20, 25 minutes for us, for you to learn how to do it. And then after you get used to it, maybe five minutes per subject. But we don't have to do that anymore because we have a new, new thing called, a, well, a newer one called a, at auto Talarac that does the affine transformation instead. It is there if you want it. Uh, the manual procedure is good if you want to align around the AC and PC. <coughs> okay, it's really good for that, and, and pretty much the medial, the medial line is, is, uh, is good too. Uh, but for the rest of the brain, not so good. So mostly it's not used anymore, the manual procedure. We will generally use uh, an affine procedure, and even more than that, we'll, we, well, the, the automatic procedure, even more than that, we'll use uh, a nonlinear procedure now. But let's go through some uh, examples of at auto Talarac, so you know how that, that works. Uh, we will have the, uh, this is done in similarly to 3D Valreg. You give it a base. In this case, the base is template. You give it a suffix. If you, if you say none, or you don't put anything at all, it will just change the anat plus origin to the output of anat plus Talarac. Okay. Uh, and to apply that transformation that you've calculated that goes into the header of anat plus Talarac, you can apply it with at auto Talarac or AD warp. It's another, another program. And we're going to, so if we apply it to that funk slim data set we saw earlier, our statistical results, we want to put that into standard space two. We can do that uh, uh, giving it the anatomical parent of the anat plus Talarac and then s and say that we, we don't need it at the resolution of the anat plus Talarac data set, which is at one millimeter. We we'll want it at, uh, say, two millimeter resolution. And that's how you do that here. Okay, so comparison of uh, here is the data analyzed with fun the Funk Slim results and in the original space, this is put into Talarac space with the at auto Talarac procedure and the manual procedure. All pretty similar, but there are little differences. Some years ago, there was some controversy of which space should you use. Uh, you could choose Talarac space, you could choose MNI space, and yet there's a third space called MNI and at. 
So Talarac space, you saw what that is. That's you know, roughly fitting that, that, uh, that Talarac uh, uh, coordinate system. Uh, we have the TTN27, which makes a fine base in Talarac space. Uh, the one thing to note about the Talarac uh, space and atlas is that there is no corresponding MRI data set that goes with the original Talarac atlas that was done post-mortem from slices. We don't have a subject to align to from the original. We have the TTN27 that we put into the Talarac space using AFNI and the manual procedure, but we don't have something that exactly corresponds to that atlas. Um, but if you, using the N27 space in, uh, N27 data set in various spaces, Talarac, MNI, MNI, and that, it all look, they all look fairly similar. So the MNI space is one that was aligned to the original MNI, I think 300. Uh, and then this is in the MNI 152 space. And uh, the one nice thing about the, uh, the Talarac space was that the anterior commissure is at 000. zero, zero. MNI space 000 doesn't correspond to any particular structure. Uh, but Eikhoff and Zillis, when they reduced, uh, when they uh, distributed their uh, SPM toolbox, anatomy toolbox, they liked that feature of the, of the Talarac space having a 000 at, uh, at the anterior commissure. So they, they moved the MNI space a little bit. So they moved it just five millimeters in one direction, six millimeters in another, and so we have an MNI in that space. And that added some confusion because people weren't sure, is it MNI space, is it MNI in that? And it's not very clear. But in AFNI, we try to, to say that these, this is the one space and this is the other, MNI and MNI in that. Now, I will say that even if something is an MNI, spa MNI space, there are at least a dozen variants of MNI space. And there are a lot of variants of Talarac space. You know, every subject that's aligned to Talarac space that's a template is a different variant. So none of these are, you know, set in stone that this is, is, uh, uh, this is the gold MNI space. So when you report that it's an MNI space, or you, have to, you should also report what template specifically that it's been aligned to. And that will be a better definition of that that template space. Okay, so MNI space is slightly larger than Talarac space. Not too different, but slightly larger. MNI and that slightly shifted from the MNI space too. AFNI will show you all three versions by default of the coordinates in, in the Where Am I GUI and on the command line showing you what where you are in any of those three spaces. If you're not interested in any of those spaces, you can define your own list or you can say <coughs> I'm only interested in one of the spaces that's in an environment variable called AFNI Atlas Template Space List. Uh, all of this is controllable. Now AFNI was originally built around Talarac space so there was an initial uh, preference for Talarac, but now there's almost no, nowhere uh, that uh, AFNI is built, is done specifically for any particular space. And that's why we can work with different animal spaces uh, equally. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter for AFNI. You have a question? Yeah. Is there ability to warp from a atlas space into a subject specific space? Yeah, I will show, I've got two slides on, on that. Okay how to go from standard space to original space. All right, I'm going to show, so here, this is an example where, where we've aligned the AFNI data 6 and that, and that data set, set to the TTN27 data set with just an affine transformation. So the affine transformation is just a squeezing, stretching, uh, and shearing. It's not a nonlinear alignment. This, this goes through first a step of Unifying it first, where we're going to remove any bias, any any bright <coughs> spots around the the data set, and then we're going to start our nonlinear warping procedure. First, on a large neighborhood, then a small neighborhood, and smaller and smaller, 
and this goes up to a level 9 here and this this is the result the at the end of this transformation uh, and this is what the N27 data set looks like as a reference. And this is a rendering using the AFNI render plugin of, of these steps. So you can see what happens with each iteration. So you can turn, you can morph one data set into another using this nonlinear warping. And it works pretty well. Okay, and uh, here's some comparisons of nonlinear warping using 3D cube warp versus affine registration over 188 data sets and looking at uh, resting state fMRI. And here we're just looking at the differences between a nonlinear warp using a, a seed at the left precuneus and, uh, and you can see correlations are higher with nonlinear warping. Um, and then nonlinear warping to a detailed template like the, the TTN27 uh, or the MNI152, I forget which one was used here, and uh, versus the MNI152, the old version, the MNI152, that blurry version. And so that, that template is a kind of uh, uh, the limiting factor on how good your registration can be. So if your template is blurry, your group results will be blurry too. So the, the finer your template, the, the better your results will be. So you want a detailed template. And so now we recommend using detailed template and, and nonlinear warping. And we've got a few tools for doing that. Now, disadvantages are sometimes the skull stripping has to be done better. Um, uh, uh, on, on humans, this, uh, the, the shapes of the brains can be different, you know, more than, than in, in macaques and rats. And, uh, and this, the skull stripping uh, has to be done pretty carefully uh, or, or sometimes not at all. So, um, so if, you, if you strip off a piece of brain, that nonlinear warping will, will, will treat it differently. And if you add in a little piece there, here and there, uh, it, will, it will be included and warped differently. So you got to be careful, more careful with skull stripping with nonlinear warping. On an affine, you don't really have to care too much. As long as it's generally done correctly, <laughs> it's, it's okay. Because we're only picking one transformation for the whole data set. If a piece is gone in that, we can still apply it to the whole data set uh, before warp. Okay, so we've got a couple scripts here. Um, so the uh, autowarp.py is our, 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 our script that will, it, it calls at autotelerac for us to do the affine transformation, and then it calls 3D warp to do the nonlinear transformation. And uh, uh, this is an example. Same syntax as before, um, but it's doing a lot more stuff. Now, nonlinear warping takes a lot longer than what we were doing before. So rather than a few minutes, it'll be hours for, for this, this. So we don't do this in the class because we'll spend the whole day waiting for it. Um, and we have an even newer script called at SS Warper. Uh, the syntax here is super simple. Uh, you give it input and you give it uh, what to call the output and it, and, and it gives you a, uh, an edged uh, display to show you uh, how well your your image this is the the uh, image let's see if I can show you so this is one of the uh, JPEG images that it it shows you this is the T1 data set we saw in the class uh, for the AFNI data 6 and that directory aligned to the TTN 27 with the edges of the uh, TTN 27 shown so it's not perfect but it does a pretty good job so and this one combines skull stripping with it. So we've got skull stripping, the affine transformation. It's even slower. It's doing a lot of fancy calculations to do this. It does this in an iterative way, rough calculation for skull stripping, rough, rough calculation for warping going back and forth, and it finally gets to a skull stripped data set and then goes through the nonlinear warping again. Okay, so we have a lot of atlases that are distributed with AFNI. Some are distributed directly, and some you have to call a special script that will go fetch them for you, and some are just stored on our website. Um, rather than show it to you here, we can look at it inside AFNI. 
So let's do that. So rather than call AFNI, well, let's we can switch to uh, the a bin directory, for instance. Let's, let's, I'm going to go to the one off my home directories. This is where I've got AFNI installed. Wherever you have AFNI installed, it's probably tilde slash a bin. Right? If you type which AFNI, you'll, you can know where your AFNI is installed. And it's most likely that your atlases are also stored there. They don't have to be installed where your AFNI binary is, but probably most of you have them there. And if I do ls uh, star dot head, I'll see all the data sets that are in the AFNI directory. And if I just type AFNI, I can look at them. So let's let's look at some some things in AFNI. I'll change my underlay to one of my templates. So let's say I'll pick the TTN27. All right. So uh, and if I change the overlay, I can pick one of the atlases here. Now most of these are they're, they're all in different spaces and some aren't appropriate for this particular data set. Um, it will let you choose them anyway, uh, but uh, let's let's stick to ones that are uh, registered to Talarac space. So all these ones that start with TT something are in Talarac space. That's an older version. Let's pick the uh, MPM 18 down here. This is a uh, ICOF Zillus. The, the the one before was a uh, I think 1.4. This is 1.8 of the ICOF Zillus uh, uh, anatomy toolbox. So this is the maximum probability map. And uh, you'll see that there are some regions identified there. So this is our this is one of the atlases. This particular one was made from. Uh, 10 post-mortem data sets that were uh, then aligned to, uh, to the, uh, the MNI space. Sorry, one more time. So the underlay is MPM 18 and the overlay was... And that, this one in the underlay, I'm using TTN27. You can look at the top caption here oh, to okay. see uh, what's, what's what. So TTN27 is my underlay, and I've made my overlay the uh, TTCAEZ MP18 plus Talarac. And if you look in the overlay panel, you'll see that the region is identified by label there. I can also show the label. Let's see if I can get to it. Let's see. Show the label here by right clicking on the grayscale bar and then pick uh, something like upper left for label. So I'll make it, uh, make it larger for you to see. Okay, so I can see the label here. Okay. So atlases can be shown like that. Um, and uh, let's see, we can do other things with, with uh, atlases. This is in a standard space now. This is in Talarac view up here. If you have an Anat plus a Ridge and an Anat plus, plus Talarac, you can switch between the two by selecting the Ridge view or the Talarac view. Okay, so um, here let's uh, right click on an image viewer. It doesn't matter which one. And you can see that there, there are some things here. Uh, you can go to Atlas location. You can choose where am I. You can do Atlas colors. So let's start out with go to Atlas location. So here, let's say I want to go to the left hippocampus and select set and it takes me to the left hippocampus. 
And here, this atlas calls it HIPCA. Uh, I can also go to Atlas Colors. Now, this doesn't have to be done. If you have an Anat plus Talarac, you don't have an atlas shown on your overlay. Uh, uh, you, you can still do these same things. You can go to any atlas location. As long as it, there's a data set available to say how to get there, it will, sh it will show you these. So you can select Atlas Colors. And here it shows you a list for your whatever you've set as your primary atlas. And by default, it shows you the Talarac Demon as your primary atlas. Um, so let's say I want to show this in red. So I've got the left hippocampus shown in red here. So you can see the, re the Talarac Demon's version of the hippocampus is showing up in red over my, my uh, Eikhoff Zillis uh, maximum probability map. And, uh, uh, or it could just be you know, with your functional results. You can just show different regions like that. That's one way you can, you can see these, these uh, different regions. Um, let's go on to another, another thing you can do with, with atlases. You can right click and uh, select where am I? So where, the Where Am I GUI pops up, and we've got a lot of different things showing up here. And uh, first, it shows you what the original the space of your data set is. So my, this data set is the TTN27 data set. So of course, it's in TTN27 space, which is a variant of Talarac space. And then it says the coordinate, which is related to this coordinate here. This is RAI order, and over here, this, this focal, focal point is in LPI order, so the, the, the data set has the first two items reversed. Yeah. So this is 32, 24, and this is negative 32, negative 24, and then negative 9 in Talarac space. And then it has the, con the transformation of that coordinate into MNI and MNI in that space. Why is, why is it first because of the radiologist and neurologist bias? Um, these are just the the publication standard has been in LPI order, what we call LPI order, and as we mentioned, that's just the opposite of what FSL and SBM might call LPI order. They might call that uh, RAS order. Anyway, so when you publish your result, you should say this is on the left and this is on the right and this is posterior and it uh, and, and anterior and that kind of thing. But the, so what I'm getting is the atlas, so AFNI is left is right, AFNI, but the atlas is left is left, is that, or it's just that they... It the, has nothing to do with, this just has to do with how, what you report as left and right. So you just be clear on what you're looking at and what you how you describe it. It's not a property of the atlas, it's, and it's not even a property of, of AFNI, really. It's a, a, a coordinate order, and there are 48 possible orders that we can describe every coordinate. So uh, for when Where Am I pops up, it, it shows you that coordinate you know, through different atlases, and it shows you the Haskins Pediatric Atlas, uh, and because there's a transformation from MNI space to the Haskins Pediatric space, it shows you that there. And then we can scroll down. It shows you what it is in the tal in the in the uh, Eikhoff Zillis MPM space, which is at the hippocampus. Uh, and it shows you not just the, the coordinate where your where your, your cursor is, but what's nearby, because alignment isn't perfect. And so no matter what we do, we won't have perfect alignment, and we can't say for sure that this is the hippocampus. And it's a different subject. The template is a different subject or, or a composite of, of a group of subjects. Uh, so we give you a neighborhood of regions that it might be related to. And we go out, I think, to nine millimeters. So if we find another region within that nine millimeters, we'll let you know that there are other regions nearby that could be that location for that subject. And it's not just, it's a, prob it's a, it's a uh, 
This is because of alignment, it's because of variability across subjects, it's also because of how the atlases were built. Every atlas is made with a whole set of procedures. So we show to, for every atlas that we can get to, uh, that ha from, from the space of the data set that you're in. And at the top, um, let's see if this will work. We, will, we have a link to the NeuroSense database. So this coordinate is in that uh, database. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Okay, it takes it a little bit of time for, and it will show you uh, maps that are associated with that particular coordinate. It's, it's, it's sometimes a little slow, uh, but it will also give you the studies that are related that have published something about that coordinate, and, and uh, these are, have been converted to MNI space. And the way we go from Telerac space to MNI space for the TTN27 uh, space in particular is that we have we have an exact transformation because we transformed it from MNI to Talarac so we know exactly how we did it so we just take that out of the header and transform it back and that's what we send to Neurosynth and we say what's there there are other things that we do um, that are kind of similar to that uh, but the databases come and go so